and he is a, a professor of mathematics at the University of California, San Diego, where he studies cognition and mathematics, uh, learning and teaching of linear algebra and other subjects. Uh, I'd like to just highlight a couple of the titles of some of his presentations because they're very intriguing and I think you might want to look them up afterwards. Uh, one is, what is mathematics? A pedagogical answer to a philosophical question. Uh, another is attention to meaning and another is advanced mathematics, mathematical thinking at any age. And with that, I'd like to... Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the uh, program committee for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, some um, of my ideas. Uh, as you see, the title is a research-based framework uh, for teaching mathematics effectively. I really don't want to get into, into the uh, details of the theory itself. What I thought to do is simply enter the classroom and talk about the specific content that we are teaching in mathematics and uh, deal with that question of what kind of changes we, we want to make through some uh, specific uh, uh, ideas and specific content. <clears throat> so if we reflect on, on our activities and our effort, all of us, as, as educators, mathematics educators, or science educators, we we'll realize that actually there are two fundamental questions that are of great interest to all of us. And it's easy to formulate these two questions. These are colossal questions to answer, very difficult ones. But they can be, uh, we can subsume them, subsume everything that we are doing under two fundamental questions. And the question is, what mathematics should we teach? And the second, how should we teach it? Of course, what it means is, how should we teach it? And so, that students will learn it, OK? So these are two fundamental questions that the theoretical perspective that uh, I, I devised uh, in many years based on numerous studies and numerous observations in all grade levels, uh, from elementary, secondary, and post-secondaries. The framework called DNR based instruction in mathematics. I'll explain what DNR, uh, what this, uh, in, these initials came from. Definitely do not say, uh, do not entail, do not um, uh, reason, uh, but something else. So that's not what DNR is. Uh, so what DNR responds respond to this question is quite complicated and rich. However, I'd like just to capture it uh, with two uh, simple responses. The first uh, is the, regarding the question, how should we teach it? The central focus should be on students' intellectual need. I will define this concept. I'll explain it through examples. And the second one that entails actually philosophical that, that just the, 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 the reference that you just gave to, um, uh, to a paper that I wrote uh, entitled, What is Mathematics? A, uh, a Pedagogical Answer to Philosophical Questions, which the argument there is that mathematics actually, it's not what most people view as consisting of one category of knowledge, which for simplicity I call that subject matter, which are axioms, definition, theorems, proofs, examples, uh, uh, particular, uh, 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 particular algorithms, uh, and so on and so forth. My argument is that philosophically we can actually uh, substantiate that, that mathematics consists of two categories of knowledge. Uh, and there is this very strong evidence throughout the development, uh, the historical development of mathematics that this is the case, that only, not only subject matter constitute mathematics, but something else which is called ways of thinking. And during the breakout session, I'll give many examples of ways of thinking. For now, we can think of ways of thinking as conceptual tools that are essential to create the subject matter. But I'll give some examples. So um, if I had to summarize in one sentence uh, my observations uh, in all grade levels, and when I go to uh, in the last 10 years since I moved from Purdue to UCSD, I've been working very closely with teachers in uh, uh, junior high and, and secondary and, uh, and high school, as well as the classes that I'm attending uh, in post-secondary, mainly learn algebra uh, and calculus and transition courses, uh, as, as I'm sure you have some of them in your, um, uh, in your institutions. If I have to summarize my observations from all these classrooms, I would say the following. Students are intellectually aimless in the mathematics class. <laughs> 
They sit there and they have absolutely no idea what's going on. They might understand the concept locally, but where this is coming from, where we are dealing it, it's completely absent. So let me, uh, let me pause here and, and, and begin with some examples. The first example is a study that I, I did a while ago with 25 uh, students, junior and seniors, who have taken already differential equations to learn algebra. And you can see the grade level. You cannot see it here, unfortunately. But you can see there, you know, the, the, it's quite reasonable. 3.0 and 2.91 uh, in, in that scale. And this was six to one year after they have taken these two courses. As I said, one differential equation in algebra, there are courses like that, and followed by uh, elementary uh, uh, linear algebra. And I asked them very simple questions. So I'm going to sh uh, share with you some of them. Uh, can three vectors in R2 be independent? So you see on the left, that left column is correct, incorrect, no answer, 48%. Suggest three independent vectors in R3, 52%. Define linear independence, 28%. Define span, you see it's just disastrous results. Give an example of, 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 of a subspace, 16%. And so on and so forth. These are very basic, very elementary, uh, elementary uh, questions. I also interviewed them. It was clear to me that these students learned the content in that moment in order to survive, but they never understood where the idea coming from. And therefore, they were not able to retain it. So this is uh, one example. Let me just give you another example uh, in another study about the concept of function, but I somehow was issues from calculus. And one of the questions we ask uh, this group of uh, uh, juniors, what is so fundamental about the fundamental theorem of calculus? Why is it called so? Well, why, in other words, why is it so important? So, silence. There was some discussion. What do you mean by to be fundamental? Just to be, what, what's the importance of it? Again, I'm really giving you the skeleton of the whole thing. And then uh, the instructor gave up and said, well, Tell me, what is the fundamental form of calculus? <laughs> Silence? Well, it is something about integrals and derivative, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is the inverse of derivative. That's the maximum we, we were able to get. Just to show you that us, actually it is possible otherwise. Others, another class who thinks were taught differently was asked the same question. One of the students answered, the fundamental form of calculus tell us that in order to find the area of a region under a curve of function, we do not need to divide the region into, squ into squares, that's what he's, the way it says this, he said it, count, divide, uh, divide into square again, count. We only need to find the antiderivative of function and plug in the endpoints. You see the difference in the quality of the. Now, I'm going to give one more example because uh, yesterday I was told that there would be many high school teachers here. So last night I decided to uh, add this, this example, which was not there before. One of the things that happening, at least in California, that there is this rush to algebra. Students have to learn algebra in eighth grade. And what, what really ends up students learning in algebra is that manipulating some symbols, as long as you have x and y there, that counts as algebra. <laughs> So here's an example, uh, and I have numerous, this is not anecdotal evidence, I have numerous examples of this kind that converge into a system of evidence. The problem is uh, everybody will recognize a very standard problem. Tom and John are roommates, they decided to paint their, their room. This is a problem that the teacher gave in the classroom, and I sit in the class with the permission of the teacher, I can interact uh, with the students as much as I want. Uh, Tom can paint the room in four hours, and John a perfectionist in eight hours, how long would it take them to paint the room if they work together? The, 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 group, the uh, class were working in small groups, and I was just walking from one to another, and then in, in one of the group, uh, Kate was something, uh, somehow leading the discussion, and she said to me, would you help us do the equation? And I see in her notes uh, was 4x plus 8x. So me as a teacher now, uh, temporarily, I said, OK, fine, um, uh, what is x? I must tell you that they all were very surprised about my question. What do you mean, what is x? It's just, well, well, everybody knows what is x. But she said, x is the house. So this is a part of the DNR approach 
is really to continually communicate with the students in such a way that you intellectually destabilize them. <laughs> that is the purpose of DNA. And I said, you want to find X or you want to find the house? <laughs> she, she was absolutely shocked about that. So after a while, I convinced them to forget about X <laughs> and just, just build an image. One of the things that is so missing from teachers' per repertoire of reasoning is to build an image, to act out the situation. They just see a problem, look for keywords, do something. That is the approach, that is the way of thinking. Okay, this is an example. The way of thinking that govern their mathematical behavior. What was a very interesting is I left them, I came back after a while, and this is what they did. When they, I encouraged them to forget for a moment X and Y, just think about the problem. So they divided, Kate was leading, as I said, divided the, uh, the, 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 the top rectangle, divided into four, and they said, okay, Tom paints one fourth of the house in one hour, divided another, each one of, of these squares into rectangles into uh, two, and she said, John paints one eighth of the house in one hour, Therefore, well, after one hour, they will do this much. After another hour, they will do this much. And they got stuck. They didn't know what to do. I said, you know, think about it a little bit more. I went to see another one. And then Kate raised her hand and said, Mr. Mr. Come here. That's the way they called me. Uh, and she said, oh, I think we figured this out. Three-fourths of the house is painted in two hours. Now, that's what we see, right? Three-fourths of the house, one two, three, built in two, in two hours, so one-fourth of the house will be painted in two-thirds of an hour. Therefore, the whole house will be painted in two hours and 40 minutes. Perfect. Well, how, you know, you see something like this and you are elated that students can really, there is a local conceptual development. But immediately she said, this cannot be right, there's no X. <laughs> So my argument is that this cannot be right, there is no X, that is a social need response. That is the teacher impose in some way, build what we call a didactical contract with the students, that there must be X and Y there, otherwise things are wrong. And uh, whereas the house will be painted in two hours and 40 minutes is intellectual need response. Uh, so let me, now, so that I give you these examples, a little bit enter this framework and just give you a skeleton of what this framework consists of. As I said, there are these two fundamental questions, and DNR attempt to answer these two questions uh, and address them, not really give a, a, a finite answer. Uh, by the way, the, this, the first question may not be seem as uh, so crucial, but let me uh, just uh, illustrate it by a set of questions. Uh, what do we, why do we teach long division algorithm, the quadratic formula, techniques of integration, and so on? When we have any calculator on um, today, um, iPhone or anything, you can do remarkable things, uh, uh, perform ar arithmetic operations, so many uh, complicated uh, equations, even integrate complex functions quickly and accurately using uh, electronic technology. Why do we need to teach these kind of things? So the point is, what I'm trying to make is that because we are not really thinking, we are thinking in terms of subject matter rather than in terms of ways of thinking. Something that I will elaborate much more in, in the uh, breakout session. So what is really DNR? Again, a very, uh, a very rough skeleton is the following. DNR is really a system of three categories uh, of constructs. Uh, the first one is set of premises, and then you have concepts, and you have claims. Uh, the premises are really um, a set of uh, explicit assumptions that are drawn from mostly from other theories, although there are at least one assumption uh, that is my own. Uh, and then there are concepts like ways of thinking. This is an example of a concept that is technically defined and oriented within uh, these uh, explicit assumptions. You might think of them as axioms. If somebody doesn't agree with, this, with these assumptions, really we have very little to talk about, but I'll show you some of these assumptions later. And, and the claims are assertion formulated in terms of DNR concepts, entailed from DNR premises, and supported by empirical evidence. Now, within the within set of claims, there are three that are very special. 
Uh, I'm sorry, there, are, there, are, uh, there is a set called uh, um, instructional principles. These are claims about effect of teaching practices on student learning. And it can be bad effect or, or positive effect. And as I said, it's entailed from mainly uh, empirical observations. Within this set of claims, there are three that are really special. And there are three instructional principles, what are called the duality principle, the necessity principle, and the repeated reason principle, hence the term DNR. So DNR is not this, these three principles. It's much larger than that. But I, just, I decided to call it DNR because I found these three principles can subsume a lot of the things I want to say. So let me, let me uh, uh, talk about one fundamental principle, which is the necessity principle. The necessity principle is very easy to formulate. It's like the pigeonhole principle. It's the, it's, you, can, you, can, you, you can formulate it easily, but its use or its application can be quite intricate. And the principle says simply the following. For students to learn the mathematics we intend to teach them, they must see a need for it. The, 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 biggest, the biggest word here, need. What do we mean by need? I mean intellectual need rather than social or economic need. So roughly speaking, social need is, it can be, well, I want to be a medical doctor, or I want to be a mathematician in order to help other people, uh, in order to eradicate some disease. All these are very important, or uh, economic needs, so that in the future I will have, uh, um, I will be a mathematician, I'll be rich, which is not true. But, um, <laughs> or, or I want to learn so that, uh, you know, my dad and, and, and mom will buy me a car. All these are very important, but they are not under the jurisdiction and the control of the teacher. The teacher has one and only one responsibility, is to continually perturb intellectually speaking, the students and bring them to realize there's something new to learn. So, um, so what is intellectual need, really, what I'm talking about? So this, more or less, a characterization is quite what I want to say. Intellectual need refers to the per perturbational stage and the process of explaining how and why a particular piece of knowledge came into being. It really, intellectual need deals with the birth of knowledge. So it is a juxtaposition between two things. It's the cognition of the students, what students know now, and the need of the discipline. And the intersection between the two constitute intellectual need. And I'll bring some examples. So by the way, there are five categories of intellectual need. I'll not have time to talk about them, but I'll be happy to send you material and, uh, and articles about them. There's the need for certainty. We want to, uh, we want to be certain of what we are doing. And, and uh, has to do with the concept of proof, but, not, but not, not, not entirely, because we do not prove just to be certain, okay? Uh, every student know that all the theorems in, in the book are correct, so uh, that's not the issue of being certain. Uh, the issue also, and this is the second one, is enlightenment. In other words, we want to know what causes a phenomena to be so. Not only that it is true, but what makes it to be so. The need of computation, of course, is a very powerful one. A need for communication, I'll bring some examples. A need for connection and structure. These are three or five fundamental uh, needs. And again, as I said, I don't want to get into the theory so much. I really want to uh, talk about as many examples as possible. So let me, just a very simple example from the need for communication. Say you want to teach the epsilon n definition of limit. So uh, I don't know if you, have, if you remember your experience, but I do remember this experience so vividly to this very day that the teacher came one day and he said, I'm going to write a definition now. You guys, if you don't understand it, really look for another major. And he said, OK, for every epsilon, there exists, there exists an end. So that for every end, greater than end, and so on. I couldn't understand the word what he was saying because I was shivering from that fact that may not, I may not be a major in this, uh, in, in this class anymore because I don't understand what he was saying. Uh, so there was no necessity for it whatsoever. Somehow I overcame that later, but, but the, an example of a necessity is, uh, so you, you ask students, what is the limit of 1 over n when n approach infinity? So by the way, there's no one way to necessitate things. You can necess necessitate them in many ways. The idea is to bring the student that there is something, that this concept is needed uh, because of intellectual reason. Not because, and there is a lot of, 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 of misunderstanding with respect with application, which I'll talk about that later. 
So students will say something what we would like them to say. The limit of 1 over n when n approaches 0 is because the larger the n gets, the closer 1 over n is to 0. We should embrace that. That's a v wonderful intuition. But now the role of the teacher is to destabilize them and to say that's wonderful. OK, let's look at this. Based on your own statement, if we look at this, th this um, graph of 1 over n and um, of x equal negative 1, we can say, well, the limit of 1 over n when n approaches infinity is negative 1, because the, cl the larger the n gets, the closer 1 over n is to negative 1. So what they say to you right now, right there, is that that's not what we meant. We meant something else. That's exactly what you want. You want the question is not to tell or not to tell, as many constructivists say. Okay? The question is when to tell and when not to tell. Once a student have, have understood the need for something, then you can tell them. So this is one example. Uh, let's say we want to necessitate the concept of diagonalization. And I'll show some examples of how books talk about the diagonalization from the student's point of view. It's so alien. Okay, they have no idea. But uh, that, the, the, the negative examples I'll show later. I just want to show you uh, an example of how that can be necessitated. And, and, and I, should, I should preface this by saying that the matrix theory course that I teach is completely oriented in system of equations either scalar equations or differential equations. Now, equation, the concept of equation, constitute easy intellectual need. If we really understand what system of equations is, because it's a puzzle, find me a set of numbers that, that satisfy the following miracle. That is a puzzle. And there's something about us as a human being that we want to find something that is missing, that we do not know what it is. So the whole course is organized around system of equations. And by the way, uh, we shouldn't take for granted that students understand system of equations the way I described it. What I found is that many students understand system of equations is an activity. There is some, something in front of you. You do something with it. Okay? You get some numbers. You look at the back of the book whether you got these numbers or not. It's not a perturbational stage where you see I'm looking for a number that's satisfying some condition, and then the checking becomes uh, to resolve that, uh, that, that, um, that uh, intellectual desire. In high school, actually, I found that students view the act, the, the demand to test, uh, to check, I'm sorry, to check a set of answers as a, just an extension of the activity. There is nothing there done in order to resolve a perturbation that they have experienced before. So anyway, and here we, again, this is a skeleton of, 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 uh, of, uh, of a lesson or sequence of lessons. So we start with system of equations, uh, differential equations. And the question is, how we solve it? How do we find these functions? So after some discussion, we, um, um, we br I bring students, you know, we coach them to, to remind, remember something from, uh, from calculus, that in this type of differential equation with, with uh, um, initial, uh, initial value condition, uh, the the uh, solution looks like this, y of t equals ce uh, uh, at. And what they do is they, they actually symbolically um, analogize it. They actually, they don't write this way. There is a process for them to go through this, because initially what they write is the big Y become just uh, a, uh, the, the vector c times e to the uh, matrix times the scalar. That's the way they write it. And that creates a lot of discussion. What do we mean by this? Let's now focus and see, uh, and, and see what, what we have written. But gradually, eventually, they are, we bring them to, to, uh, to write it in this way, because there is a question, by the way, what do we mean by e to a matrix? And then, again, by, analo by an ana analogizing it to the scalar case of, uh, case of Taylor expansion, uh, they, uh, they, I bring them to see what e to the matrix is. I don't deal with convergence. I mean, I live in mathematical sin for a while. That's fine, because we have, uh, we have a more honorable goal now. But whether it's convergence or not, they, don't, they will not really appreciate that question. And then, uh, we, well, we compute, we compute the solution. The solution looked like this. Notice that up to this point, I said nothing about eigenvalue, eigenvector. My goal is to necessitate it. And again, as I said, there are many ways to necessitate. This is not the only way. I'm just telling you a story of how I do it. Now, if we look at this carefully, we realize something really interesting, that if there is a relationship between the condition vector and the matrix that is like this, we get really something very nice. We get something what's called easily computable. 
And then the question would be, well, is it really the case, sorry, is it really the case that every uh, condition vector is, uh, is uh, an eigenvector of, uh, of the condition matrix? Well, it's very easy to bring an example that's not the case. The next question will be, well, maybe it is a linear combination of eigenvectors. And you can see from here that it would be worthwhile to see maybe there are matrices, OK, that they have a set of eigenvectors that, are abs that actually span everything else. And therefore, the solution will be easily computable. As you can see from here, that actually you can lead th this investigation up to a very important theorem, Jordan theorem, that every vector is a linear combination of generalized eigenvectors. So again, I give you just a skeleton, what I mean by necessitating. However, here I have to pause and say something very important about the difference between local necessity and the global necessity. You can necessitate different concepts separately, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to create an environment in the classroom that there is a big investigation. There are questions that we all understand and appreciate. And every step, everything that we do, every concept that emerges, every theorem that we state, in uh, in, uh, uh, intend to uh, promote the investigation. For example, in linear algebra uh, course, the course I was talk talking about, uh, I focus on linear system, scalar and differential. And uh, the problems include the following that I share with the students for some time. We have a system with equation. We want to know how to solve it. We want, can we, how can we solve it efficiently? Okay. So again, all these I, I, I formulate in terms that students understand. Uh, is there an algorithm solving such a system? How we determine whether a system has a solution or not? Okay. If it does, if the system is solvable, how many solutions does it have? If the system has infinitely many solutions, how do we list them? Do you see just an example of, of, of questions, and you see what's lurking behind this question? The idea of linear combination, linear dependence, basis. Everything we do is really to resolve or to advance the investigation of these questions. So it's not the point to bring necessity for every single concept in a different way, but to have a system uh, where, where, uh, where what, what we do in the classroom is to resolve uh, the, or not to resolve, but to advance the investigation. Let me give you another example of the uh, global necessity for calculus. So I'm going to show you uh, how I view what kind of things I share with the students at the very beginning so that anything we do in calculus is to promote the investigation of these questions. You can see here that the questions are my, it's, question, it's, it's formulated for, for myself at this point, and the formulation entails certain commitment in terms of, in this case, in terms of rate of change. I, the, the course that I teach in calculus is very much oriented in uh, quantitative reasoning. Uh, because um, what I found is that without really centering this in the, the calculus course in quantitative reasoning, students do not understand what we are doing. There is, this is something consistent that is done in the curriculum. Rather than doing things in the context that is most it available to the students, we do that about the representation of the concept rather than the concept itself. If you look at textbooks, for example, in calculus, you find a lot of the treatment are graphical. For example, tangent. Okay, we spend time to talk about tangent. From the student's point of view, why is why the question of tangent, if there is any question for them, is, is an important one. It is a representation of the quantities. The same thing, there are some people who promote, for example, the teaching of fractions. On, on, on the number line. Well, I want students to understand that eventually, but, uh, but that approach is teaching students about the representation of fractions, not about fractions themselves, and so on. I mean, there are many, many examples of this kind. Linear algebra, actually, for a long time, I, I had really kind of crisis because I was not very successful in, in, in teaching linear algebra the way I wanted it. I was using geometry as the what's called motivation necessitating through geometry. And what I realize is that for me, it's a wonderful conceptual tool, but students are not understanding what the raw material is. They think what I'm teaching them is really geometry. So I had to build a didactic contract with them very, very clearly at the beginning. What we are dealing with are system of equations. That, these are, this is the raw material. And if we have a geometrical intuition, it's a sort of uh, accompanying 
uh, uh, the, these, uh, these necessities and rather than being the central uh, topic. So let me share with you in my own language, and I said these languages entail certain commitments, uh, the, the global necessity for calculus. So there are really five problems. Oops, I don't know why this is one, two. It should be three, four, five. I don't know why. It changed. <laughs> The first is what called the accumulation problem, okay? Given the rate of change of one quantity with respect to the second quantity, can, and if so, how can, we determine the accumulation function of the first quantity with respect to the second quantity? This is the first fundamental question that is fascinating. If we have an object moving in space and we know that it's moving at constant speed or constant velocity and it moves a certain amount of time, it's trivial, okay? But what's fascinating is that even though it doesn't move in constant velocity, still we can calculate the distance it traveled. So it's called accumulation, fund, accumulation problem. So I share these type of problems in terms, in an example that students understand. The second is called the rate change of problem. Once we realize that actually rate of change is very important because that's really what's available to us if we want to build a model, in most cases, what's available to us, rate of change. And it's from the rate of change that we try to build the model. Then there is a question, Given a functional dependency between two quantities, can, and if so, how can, we determine the rate of change of one quantity with respect to the second quantity? You know, for example, the chain rule is, is uh, very fundamental here. Uh, the, what's called the characteristic value problems. Given a functional dependency between two quantities, can, if so, how can, we determine the value of dependent quantities that are of particular characteristic? For example, maximum and minimum problem that we are looking for particular points, for particular inputs, that they have certain characteristic. Maximum, minimum, mean value, these are very fundamental problems. Of course, the approximation problem, okay? So how do we determine, without reading the whole thing, you see, you know, we have, we have a model, we have a function, how do we approximate it? And the, fun, the, the, the fascinating thing is that the approximation problem, Taylor theorem, is really related to fundamental theorem of calculus. That's what, what, what we do, right? We look at the difference and then we, we realize it's integral and then we integrate by part and so on and so forth. And the last problem to me is really important one because one of the things that happening in the, the, in the uh, calculus reform, uh, I think, lost is that especially in, within the, the uh, mathematics education community, there is tremendous de-emphasis on computational fluency. And I cannot understand how it's possible to teach calculus without manipulation of symbols, without having really uh, a, a mastery of all the, uh, the, of all the um, uh, manipulation of, of um, um, mathematical symbols. So it's not just we want to investigate these questions, we actually need, want, what is the system of methods for investigating and, and, and resolving uh, uh, these questions? So that is, entails a commitment, very strong commitment to computational fluency. How am I doing with time? Pretty much there. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Let me uh, just say a few words about, and then we can continue in the, um, um, in the follow-up session there. There's a difference between, people confuse this a lot, in, between intellectual need, intrinsic motivation, and application. From a cognitive point of view, application are there in order to, if a concept began to form, or has been formed, is to, to solidify that concept. Now that I have a concept in mind, I can go and apply it. It doesn't mean that necessity that cannot come from application, but there is a difference. Application is after the concept has been learned, more or less, whereas intellectual necessity has to do with the birth of the concept, where it's coming from, okay? And the intersection between what the students know and the, and the discipline itself is really what leads to intellectual uh, necessity. Um, so intrinsic motivation, it's really, it really deals with something else. It deals with interest. Uh, so there are, roughly speaking, there are really three cat there, there are things, the things are related, but I want to emphasize that separate. When I talk about intellectual need, I don't need, I don't mean motivation. Usually intrinsic motivation, intrinsic motivation deals with three categories. So called the need for autonomy, the need for competence and the need for uh, relatedness. And these, the argument by cognitive psychologists that these are actually uh, innate needs. So what are they, uh, quickly? The need of autonomy is the need for freedom so that a person can follow her or his own inner uh, interest. Uh, the need for competence 
is that I want to be effective. I want to uh, uh, um, help others, for example. And uh, the need for related, relatedness, after all, we live in a society and we, we need to relate to each other. So all these are very important needs. And, and, and the point is that they are different from intellectual need. And the role of the teacher, in my view, is should, the, the main jurisdiction of the teacher is to apply intellectual need. Let me see where I am here. I'm not going through the DNR premises uh, because we don't have time. Uh, are we there? Yeah. OK, so um, I will stop here. And the uh, follow-up session, I will continue with some examples uh, with more aspect of DNR. Let's see what I wrote here. More aspect of DNR in examples of, of curricula that adhere to DNR. Thank you for listening. This program is protected by a copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice Digital Media Services.